It is now time for game seven between the Indiana Pacers and the New York Knicks. Halliburton to Siakam. Siakam jumper, that's good. He was terrific on Friday night. Turner, corner three is good. Miles Turner continues to shoot so well from downtown. Nice feet inside, Siakam. Siakam, nice move, step back is good. Turner guarded by Hart. Shot clock at three. Pascal Siakam, our three-pointer, he's perfect so far. Five for five with 11 points. And Brunson scores, but the Pacers off the make, get a layup down the other end. Siakam to Shepard. Halliburton left open, wide open, three is good. Three's Halliburton and three assists. Cross court to Shepard. Halliburton, fake sidestep, three-pointers up, got it again. Tyrese Halliburton, back-to-back -back buckets, he has eight, and the lead is nine for Indiana. Three-pointer is good, Halliburton again has come alive. Halliburton, another three, puts it in, Tyrese Halliburton, 14 points here in the first quarter, it's a 15-point lead. McConnell crossover, shot in the paint is up, shot is good. T.J. McConnell once again, what a spark off the bench. Siakam double team, finds Shepard, Shepard, Jackson, slam dunk. They've now taken 27 shots and they've missed five. Turner, got it. McBride, down the lane, goes inside, blocked by Turner. Pace is looking to push every single time. Eastman knocks down the three. Halliburton on the bounce. Inside, two-pointer, shot's good. Tyrese Halliburton, six of eight from the field. He's got 16. Brunson swatted out of bounds by Turner. Siakam on the drive. Halliburton lines up, three-pointer, got it. Tyrese Halliburton with his fifth three-pointer of the game. Siakam kicks it back out to Neesmith. Neesmith pulls up, elbow jumper's good. Siakam kicks it out. Halliburton back up top. Turner gets a clean look for three. Got it. Miles Turner from downtown. Brunson turns it over. Halliburton, good hands. Lays it up and in. The steal and the bucket. Neesmith fakes. Neesmith drives. Neesmith scores. All five starters and double figures for the Pacers. Another steal on the inbounds. Counted on a foul. Neesmith stuck in and got hit. Halliburton connects on a three. Tyrese Halliburton now 24 points. Shepard to Jackson. Jackson fakes, drives, layup, count it, and a foul. As McConnell puts it in, this is one of the greatest shooting performances in NBA playoff history. You look at these Pacers as Halliburton drives, finds Turner. Turner floats it up and in. Halliburton drives, lays it up and in, and a foul. Turner drives inside, layup is good. Turner with 17 points. Nimhard sees an opening, gets inside, lays it up. Nimhard now with 15 points and the lead back up to 17 with 320 remaining. And the Indiana Pacers back in the conference finals, first time in a decade. They'll face the Celtics starting on Tuesday. Come back from down 3-2, win the last two games and defeat the Knicks in seven games. This is Tyrese Halliburton and you're listening to Setting the Pace. And that is how it's done, Pacer Nation. In the garden, game seven, backs against the wall. Elimination right there in front of you. But you know what? These Indiana Pacers, they learn from their mistakes in game five, Fachi. They take care of business at home in game six, and they go on the road and dominate, absolutely dominate New York from start to finish, winning 130 to 109 and advance to the Eastern Conference Finals. Fachi, how are we feeling? I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought we were going to be in for a bloodbath, a, a game that we were going to have to scratch and claw. I thought maybe an ugly game. What we saw today was a Indiana Pacer masterpiece. They were absolutely historic in this game. They dropped 130 points. That's the most scored in a game seven since 1963. They shot 67.1% from the field. They got there on the point one because that was the best ever in game seven. They brought it today from top to bottom of this roster they did what they needed to do when you talked about from coming back from that game five performance carlisle called this group out and what would they do at this point they, they were down two nothing in the series at that point it, it's do or die they responded by winning four of the next five games and the final two in this series to move on to the eastern conference finals for the first time in a decade in a decade Fachi. and what's incredible is the New York Knicks were really trying to bring the dramatic side of things to it. OG Ananobi returns to, to action to play. He said he was going to play in Game 7 no matter how his hamstring felt, and he went through the workout, he was ready to go, he gets into the starting lineup, and yes, he did have five points in five minutes, 
but he could not move Fachi. They had to pull him from the game. He could not play in this one. Josh Hart played 37 minutes with an ab strain. You could definitely tell he couldn't be himself. He only had 10 points. And then Isaiah Hartenstein, 0 of 2 from the field, 0 points, only 8 rebounds for Hartenstein in 30 minutes. And then Jalen Brunson leaves the game in the third quarter after the Pacers were already up by 20 points with a fractured left hand. He would not return to the game. And if anybody wants to use that as an excuse as why the Pacers won this game, don't let them lie to you. The Pacers had just held off New York, who cut the lead to six or seven points. Indiana goes on this huge run. They're up by 20 points before Jalen Brunson exits the game. So let's not sit here and act like Jalen Brunson's injury is why New York ended up losing by 21 points. The Pacers dominated this game from start to finish, and it all started with Pascal Siakam getting things going. He was a perfect, like, four for four to start the game, and then Tyrese Halliburton finished it up in that first quarter. Thank you to the fan in the plaid shirt with the cap on, the tan cap on, because you guys... Uh, you and your buddy over there talking trash with Tyrese Halliburton, you got him going. So the Halliburton hecklers, learn your lesson. The Halliburton hecklers, I think that's great. Yeah, Halliburton had 14 points in the first quarter, immediately looked better than, than he did in, in games one and game five. So I felt that you knew, okay, hey, he, he's feeling it. He's in for a rhythm. Siakam here, he touched on, got the Pacers going early. The 39 points that Indiana scored in the first quarter were the most ever in a game seven. Mm. I sound like a broken record saying it, but that's just how many records the Pacers set today. The starters were all phenomenal. They all scored at least 17 points in this game. Everybody brought it. But I felt like for Tyrese Halliburton to get it going early on, it, it was very evident that he... He had a certain stroke going from three-point land. He started out uh, at least four or five from three, finished the game six of 12 from three, 10 of 17 overall for 26 points in a, a closeout game in game seven in the Garden. This is what I mentioned. This is how legacies are built. In his first playoff run, he had a game winner in his first round, all right? Then he had 26 points in the closeout game that I mentioned. What more could you possibly ask for? For a guy in his first playoff uh, appearance, I, I think that he's answered any and all questions. And I think he's probably the most hated man in New York right now, replacing like a Trey Young from the past when Knicks fans had that beef. They are um, they're very mad at Tyrese, and we love this man right now because he has backed up exactly what we knew he was capable of. We talked about it last episode when we previewed this game. We said the stars have to show up on the road. And that's what happened. Tyrese Halliburton, 26 points, and Pascal Siakam, second in scoring with 20 points. But Andrew Nimhard, Pachi, let's talk about Andrew Nimhard just for a quick second because I know that he got he got beaten up this entire series because, oh, he can't guard Jalen Brunson. He can't do anything. He had the game-winning shot in game three, and I felt like in game seven, he had a probably his best overall performance of any game he's played in this seven-game series. He was better defensively when he was out there guarding different players and then on offense. Every time the Pacers needed a big basket to kind of stop any of the Knicks runs, it was that sure. mid-range jumper from him or that drive to the basket. You know, I think Doris Burke talked about it one time where he kind of holds the ball like a running back and then puts it up at the last second when he has that space. And it's just like he was doing all that tonight. So what what you can say about your star stepping up is great, but Andrew Nimmer going 8 of 10 with 6 assists, 5 rebounds, 20 points in 34 minutes. I thought he was phenomenal tonight as well. He made tough layups too. There was a lot of reversals that I was like, whoa, I did not think that was going to go. He had no problem taking it in the paint. So I thought that he was great, but also never complained throughout the series. When he had that matchup against Brunson, it was a brutal matchup. You never heard him complain. He brought it every single night. But one of the other guys that also had a really tough matchup in this series against Jalen Brunson that brought it every single night and had some tough games was Aaron Neesmith, who yes, deserves sir. a lot of credit. Aaron e. Smith had 19 points uh, on eight of eight shooting. And I just felt like it was uh, when the Pacers need a basket, just like you said about Nemhard, Neesmith was able to deliver some clutch baskets that, that stopped some Nick runs and kept Pacer runs going. So I feel like Neesmith was another one of those guys that you're always looking to see who's going to step up in a game seven. And he really did. And look, we can go across the board over here before we get a little too far away. Pascal Siakam needs his flowers again. We touched on it, you know, a bit in the beginning, but it's like, this is well, what Hold on, hold on. Before we, before we spend time talking about Siakam and Halliburton, I want to get to them, but since you're bringing up Neesmith, I think we just need to touch on what happened in that third quarter, Fachi. Sure thing. Because the Knicks made it close. We talked about it. They cut it to six or seven points. I forget what it was. Six. Six points. 
Aaron Neesmith had like a 7-0 Pacers run there yeah. by himself. Steve McConnell were just yes. He had like two, he had a mid-range pull-up. I mean, I don't know how he was hitting these pull-ups. I never see Aaron Neesmith mm-hmm. really take these. He's hit a few of those in the playoffs. And then he had the TJ McConnell inbounds steal. And he threw it to Neesmith, who hit the layup and got the foul, made the end. I think Aaron Neesmith has been incredible as a free throw shooter this playoff run, too. So before we get to Siakam, I know we want to spend a lot of time talking about him and Halliburton. We're there on Neesmith now. I wanted to make sure I brought that up because I felt like yes. that third quarter run to cut that six point or to stop that six uh, point deficit or whatever I'm trying to say, that run, the Knicks run that cut it to six for the Pacers to then go on and extend it back to 12, 13 points. That was a difference in the game. And I, and I think that it kind of sucked the life back out of New York because every time New York was able to chip away at that lead, Indiana jumped right back into it. No, it's true. Uh, it, was, it was great great job by you to point out that run because that was the – this is the pivotal point in the game right now. The crowd is really getting involved. That McConnell steal sucked the life out of that building. It really did. TJ McConnell was a, was a killer. But – you know, Neesmith, yeah, he, he brought it. We touched on that. But first, going back to Siakam, I just feel like this series right now, Siakam was, it was the, the highs and lows of Pacer Nation at times when things got rough. People did point the finger at him. It was not justified. Pascal Siakam, the last two games for the Pacers, was huge. I saw these stats. Tyrese Halliburton and Pascal Siakam are the first duo in conference semifinals history to ever average 20 points per game, do it on 50% shooting and 40% from three. That is why you went out and got this, man, because for the first half of the year, we said, who's the second guy going to be? Who is it? Well, for many times this year, Siakam has been the number one guy for the Pacers. And, you know, fortune, it it favors the bold. The Pacers were bold. This was not the perfect time to push the chips all in and say, hey, we're ready for a championship. No, the front office went for it and they were rewarded. Pascal Siakam, a guy who's been there, who's played in Game 7s, who has a ring, was cool, calm, and collected. And at times, the Pacers hopped on his back, and he led us. And I feel like today is exactly why you take that risk on that trade. Yeah, and I mean, who says it wasn't the perfect time? It might not have seemed like the perfect time, you know, back in January, but come May, it was. But, hey, we've got two guests in here, Fachi, that want to talk about the Pacers. Let's see who it is. Uh, I think you guys might be familiar with these two faces, but we are excited to – to bring them on the podcast here and talk with them about this game. They are uh, they were able to watch this game together, and I'm sure they're celebrating together. So we've got two familiar voices to Pacer Nation. Fachi, tell them who our guests are. You guys might have heard of them. They go by Chris Denary and Jeremiah Johnson. How are you guys doing today? What's going on, Fachi? Hey, we are living life. Chris, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, I did not watch the game with JJ. I watched the game by myself in the basement uh, because I was a little nervous, but there wasn't a lot to be nervous about, was there, guys? I mean, today. this was a flat-out butt-kicking of <laughs> the New York Knicks, and uh, wow, it was awesome. Yeah, JJ, I'm curious. You know, it was fun seeing your tweets on, on – uh... Social media oh, obviously can be a little bit more active on there because you're not doing the game, but yeah. uh, you know it was. It's nice to hear from you guys because after hearing the the broadcast that we heard all series long, now we actually get some Pacers perspective on what actually happened in this series. Well, I appreciate it. It's good to have this opportunity. I feel like my voice is it's a little weak right now because there was a time in the third quarter where I was sitting on the porch and I decided to let the whole neighborhood hear me because I knew the start of the third quarter was going to be a little bit of a challenge. The Knicks made their run, and it was really important in that third quarter to build that lead back up. And the way it started to actually outscore the Knicks in the third quarter was a big step forward, and then you were kind of in cruise control in the fourth, and that's something I don't think anybody expected going into game seven. I mean, you you think it's going to be a one-possession game either way, and to be able to start so well and then just keep going and, and step on the accelerator. Every time they had a stretch, I thought, Alex, where – Maybe they were a little cautious. Maybe they were trying to milk a little bit of clock. They quickly had a fast break opportunity. And so that was important to just keep maintaining the way that they play. But uh, enough X's and O's. The Pacers are in the Eastern Conference Finals. JJ, your voice is exactly how it should be because it shows that you care a lot. You got to, you know, take the suit off off a bit live root for this team be completely biased i then i think that's awesome because this is this is the time that we've waited for all these years to be able to have this type of run you could have never predicted it but you know chris you tell me when you're watching the 
game. I mean, who was it that you felt really stood out for Indiana and stepped up in that game seven on the road? Well, I, I said all along that I think one of the keys to this series, especially in game six and seven, was Aaron Neesmith. And, you know, JJ and I were just talking. He was eight of eight from the field. He had 19 points. I mean, he had five big play, five big points in that stretch when he scored the basket. McConnell had the steal, got it to Aaron, laid it in for a three-point play. I mean, that was huge. And, and this game was a little bit like game six from the standpoint. Remember, the Pacers had a double-figure lead at halftime of game six and New York scored the first number of points to make it interesting. And that's exactly what they did tonight. All of a sudden that 15 point lead was eight, but in both instances at home and on the road, the Pacers answered in the third quarter. And I think, you know, one of the keys is all year long, the Pacers were the best third quarter team in the NBA. They averaged the most points. Uh, they had as good a differential as anybody. So it's sort of no surprise that, they would use those third quarters in the last two games uh, to get the win. And another note, I, I heard this somewhere. I think, in fact, it was from Nick Yeoman, who is a member of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway Radio Network. And I didn't even think about this. Do you realize that in 1994, 2004, 2014, and 2024, all four of those years that end in four, the Pacers have advanced to the Eastern Conference Finals? I mean, that is. And now they're in the Final Four. <laughs> that's right well let, let's keep it going i mean why stop at the eastern conference finals let's just keep stunning the world and take down boston right i mean i don't i don't think anybody's expecting that but what a what a shocker that would be for all of the nba but i'm gonna go back to you jj because i felt like game five the blowout loss it, it kind of felt like oh man this could be kind of the end of in, the pacers playoff run right they got beat so bad but i think that extra day off they had in between games or rick carlisle was really able to kind of have that film session with them and, and kind of chew into them a little bit for their effort. It seemed like a totally different team effort-wise from game six and game seven. Do you feel like game five was a learning you know, lesson for this team? It was, and it was still fresh in their minds. So when you go to game seven, the things you did in game five, you remember them. And I said this to Pat Boylan on Pacers Weekly on Saturday, and I don't know exactly how much time they had to watch film prior to game seven, but if I was the coaching staff or the video staff after game six, I would have said, all right, we're going to go through some clips. And I would have just shown game five again because they talked a lot about how how the film session after game five, it was eye opening. And, and they knew the things they did wrong and how unacceptable it was. You don't want to watch game six if you're doing well. You want to remember how you played in game five and how you just can't play that way again. So while the Knicks got some early offensive rebounds, there still was a much more concerted effort to make sure when a shot goes up, where's Hartenstein? Make sure he doesn't get a rebound. And and the Pacers, I thought also, they took advantage of the short turnaround and the fact that the Knicks were trying to bring back OG Ananobi. They were trying to play Josh Hart, depending upon how serious his injury was. And you were just able to continue to step on the accelerator. And so um, it was a little bit like the Buck series. You know, game five, after game five of the first round and after the second round, it was gloomy in Pacers land. I mean, your podcast, listening to the shows on 107.5 The Fan, I mean, it was not a pretty place. But that's the way playoff series are in the NBA. I mean, right now we're watching a game seven with Nuggets and Timberwolves. And by the time many of you are watching this, you probably will know what happened. But, you know, game game six was about as bad as it could be for the Denver Nuggets. Well, you know what? Life goes on. They live to play another day. And so after game five, the Pacers lived to play another day. They got to game six. I went into that best of three situation after the Pacers tied it up two games apiece thinking I was pretty confident. There, there's a magic right now, an aura at Gamebridge Fieldhouse. I was pretty confident that the Pacers would be able to win game six. Um, so obviously you wanted to win game five, but if you lost game five, I still felt like you were going to get another chance. And so um, while they say it's so hard to win a game seven on the road, the statistics don't exactly back that up. And Chris and I were just watching on TNT, which I think TNT does a pretty good job of having a, a pretty balanced pregame show. Like they were talking about both teams actually on the show tonight. Uh, but they, they talked about how game seven, since the bubble, more road teams have won than home teams. And so the Pacers put themselves in position and the way they started this game was just so impactful. Yeah, Chris, what does a win like this mean? for not just the Pacers, but for, for the outlook of the Pacers. When you think about how new fans are made, a lot of times they're attached to a certain run that a team might have had. A lot of people look 
fondly on the 2017-2018 Pacers or or the team that went to both conference finals in, you know, in a row in 2013-2014. Or you could look at the fact that the Pacers going into this season had one game on national television. What do you think that this win could do for this team going into maybe the offseason and into next year for just the perception around the league? Well, I think it's huge. Um, you know, so many people, I mean, Fachi, you became a Pacers fan. You, you don't really have connections to Indiana, but you became a Pacers fan because of the success that they had, and that's the team you gravitated to. I was on Twitter or X, and I saw people from Brazil, Australia, people all over the world who have been Pacers fans, and then I'm sure that Tyrese Halliburton and Pascal Siakam have brought a new level of Pacers fans. So uh, this is huge. This is huge for the franchise. It's huge for the city uh, to be back on this stage. It's something that we've experienced before with the Pacers. And uh, quite honestly, it's even sweeter because I don't think anybody expected it. Uh, We sat in a room as Kevin Pritchard met with the media uh, two and a half years ago prior to the Pacers winning 25 games and making the trade for Tyrese Halliburton. And he was honest. He said, look, we're in a rebuild. I don't know how long it's going to take. There's going to be some tough times. So think about that in October of 2022, that's the message. Here we are in May of 2024, and the Pacers are in the final four of the NBA playoffs. So it's a great tribute to the front office. It's a a great tribute uh, to Rick Carlisle and his staff and the players, and also ownership. I mean, they okayed, let's go get Pascal Siakam. Let's get a player of his ilk. And so you have to credit Herb Simon and, and all the people that have made this possible. The good news is we're not done yet. I mean, there's been a lot accomplished here. Eight wins, four in the first round, four in the second round. But uh, this is a team that I think believes that it it, it can win. The other thing I would say, and and JJ and I were talking, I think this really validates how important the in-season tournament was for the Pacers. Because Mm -hmm. when they played those games in the pool, they knew they had to win to advance. Then you got Boston at at home. You knew to go to Vegas, you had to win a one-and-done game. You won. I I just think for a young team, that gave them a lot of playoff experience during the regular season that I'm sure helped them in these last two series. You talk about Kevin Pritchard and making that trade for Tyrese Halliburton. I think there was nobody more excited than Kevin Pritchard tonight in the – you know, by the locker rooms, welcoming the team back after they won game seven. But JJ, I know you guys got to get back to your watch party here of Nuggets T-Wolves. So just last thing for you here, Pascal Siakam, Chris just talked about it. They went out and they okayed that trade. He really put this Pacers team on his back in game six and kind of willed them to that win. Did the same thing early on in the, in the first quarter and just kind of set the tone for Indiana. How big has Pascal Siakam been for this team? And, and what do you think he can add to this next series against Boston? Alex, he's been huge. And you think about, again, you know, passing along kudos to the front office. As fun as that in-season tournament run was, they all saw, well, they were thinking big picture. I don't think that they acquired Pascal Siakam thinking this was the move necessarily to get them into this year's Eastern Conference Finals. But I think they thought you needed to change just a little bit. And you had an opportunity to go get someone at that time. And how long have we seen this front office and this group be ready when the situation calls for it. If you have an opportunity, you can try to go get that guy. And when they started this rebuild, they did it with Tyrese Halliburton. And you don't know when you're going to be able to get a guy like Pascal Siakam. And so what that did by having Obi Toppin be such a key player off the bench, by having a guy that in a playoff situation, you can throw him the ball, you can attack some mismatches. Um, you know, the way he started that Buck series and then maybe some defenses – decided they were not going to let Pascal Siakam beat him, beat them. And, you know, the numbers may not have been as good, but you saw the way he played when the Pacers needed it most, that championship experience. And again, I've said this to you guys. I've said this on our Sideline Guys podcast. I really noticed, I would say, the games after the All-Star break, once he had been with the Pacers for a little over a month and Tyrese Halliburton started playing, He was really comfortable being a vocal leader. And I don't know if that was something I knew about Pascal Siakam. I'm not sure that's the role he thought he needed to have with the Toronto Raptors. Definitely not when they were winning the championship. He was kind of a guy that was eyes wide open, 
just doing what was asked of him. But he saw an opportunity to be a leader, be a guy that when times are tough and they have a huddle, a huddle chat, he sits down sometimes and he has something to say. He'll pull someone aside, grab them by the jersey, has something to say. And when he has a mid-range jumper, I'm almost, you know, marking it down as good. I mean, he's that clutch right now with with the certain shots that he's that he's good with. So I'll give you some credit. I think I maybe even retweeted one of your posts this week and and kind of silencing some of those doubters. Again, we appreciate all the Pacers fans. And it's okay if you're watching this or listening to this and you had some doubts at some point. But you're not going to be perfect every game. But what, what what we saw the last two games from Pascal Siakam, it's the reason why the front office brought him in to win a game like this, to win a series like this. And it's why you look forward to a, what you hope is a future where you've got, okay, you've got Tyrese Halliburton. You've got, you hope, Pascal Siakam. Miles Turner's been here nine years. Those three guys were at the podium today. And then you just build around them a little bit, piece by piece. And while maybe they're ahead of, ahead of the the original plan right now, that's okay. Go make the most of it right now. So shout out to you for what you were saying this week. Uh, we don't need to go through everything that people were saying. I think if you were a doubter earlier in the week, it's okay. We forgive you. Just cheer for me. I'm <laughs> moving on next round. Oh, the laundry list of bad takes. It, it, it's it's too <laughs> long right now. But at this point, look, uh, you know the, the front office rolled the dice and it paid off big time. I think as magical as this run's been, one of the things that it's been missing is you two guys. We miss you. Miss hearing you, you know, and we, like we talked about, they haven't given them the Pacers the biggest shine so far in this season. So we know where we can get it when we need it. It's you guys. So thanks a lot for coming back on. But Chris, JJ, tell everybody where they can find you out on social media. And we look forward to chatting again. Yeah, you can find me at Chris Denary on X or Twitter. Uh, I'm, I'm on Instagram, though I'm not on Instagram very much. But I was pretty active today, I think, on uh, X and Twitter. And uh, you can always reach me on Facebook, too. I welcome new friends. At Pacers JJ on Twitter. And uh, Chris is Chris is actually on, on the uh, the driveway right now. Chris, I think everyone needs to see you knock down a shot. Ooh. What do you I need a basketball. Yeah. Or, wait, well, I'll walk, get a basketball. Ken, throw him a basketball. We just had a, an attempt by pregame producer Ken Southman to throw one down. Uh, Chris said he couldn't dunk, but I know he's got the shot in him. So let's okay. let's let's make one for the people. Wait, wait. You got to talk so we see the video. We need. Yeah, well, yeah, but I need to figure down? this out. Set the camera right. down, maybe. We got to Yeah, yeah. We're gonna need the right Ken, angle for this. Wait, right. Ken Softman, who you might have seen from the shrimp eating contest at one of the Pacers games late in the I season, is here as well, pregame yeah, producer. So Ken can um commentate <laughs> and and run oh. the camera. Okay, that was come on, Chris. Come Here's on, you're warmed up, guys. You sounded like the Pacers tonight. It's all good. There it is. There it is. Hey, all right. Fifty percent from the field. We'll take that anytime. That's Couldn't pretty, really see right. it on camera, but we'll we'll trust you, Chris. We know you're not a liar. Yeah, it, it went in. Yeah. It did. It did. Hey, wait. One there we more, go. One more. One all right. More. Keep talking. Keep you guys be quiet. <laughs> all right. Here's Denary with the basketball. He moves to the right. He's gonna pull up for a fifteen footer, and he missed it. Oh. I was gonna say if he was hitting Wait, it, one more. This man's doing it all. All right, here goes. Oh, he missed it. We got. We got to get one, it. Chris. Come on, practice on you now. We're gonna get this one. I feel it, Chris. Oh, oh okay. No, now, now he's man, now the hard. camera's on him. Right I watched. I watched him hit five in a row, guys. He's better than this. Oh man. There it is. Oh. It is an eight and a half foot rim, so you know he's not okay. Used so to we've this. got a little bit of a, a faulty uh, rim here. Okay, he right. on the ten foot rim. JJ, what are we doing out here? You know, we can't even have a regulation rim out there, out your yard. <laughs> Chris, get up. Maybe we just need Chris to dunk it. You know, it's funny as I've seen Chris on NBA court I'm choking on on setting the pace. go nine for you know nine for ten on free throw. There we go. I got one. Okay, yeah. all right. Ah, that was go. my Josh Look. Hart moment. We'll edit it appropriately and make, make you look like a star. Right. It's Josh Hart moment. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You can't uh, get this kind of right. trolling you anywhere else, ladies work, and gentlemen. Well, fellas, appreciate it. Thanks for hopping on. And, uh, hey, let's keep the good times rolling. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. See you. All right. Thanks, y'all. All right, everybody. We are back. Great stuff there from JJ and Chris. Always appreciate them making time for the podcast. They're welcome on any time they want to come on. We – uh. Always uh, enjoy what we get. We never know what we're going to get when they're together. Chris and Ari, you know, 
shooting shots for us on the spot on a, on a shorter rim was wasn't necessarily the greatest percentage, but he still had a great Knicks troll there at the end of it, saying that was his Josh Hart moment. But let's get back to the Pacers here, Fachi, because we spent a little time talking about Siakam before they joined us. We talked about Siakam with uh, JJ, so I think we've got our Siakam conversation pretty much wrapped up. I thought it was just a great game from him. But Tyrese Halliburton tonight, what a what a masterful performance from him in Game Seven on the road, really making his statement. And I I talked about this earlier in the season. I said I would not be surprised if Indiana makes the Eastern Conference Finals this year and has a similar run to what the Hawks did when they made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. Now, I think that this Pacers team is probably better than that Hawks team was. Yeah. But at the same time, I, that's kind of what it reminds me of a little bit, but I just feel like this is Tyrese Halliburton's coming out party a little bit even more. He came out a little bit during the IST, was a starter for the All-Star game, potentially MVP runner-up, right? But I, I just felt like in this game, he's had a lot of critics, and he responded well. And he shot the ball incredibly well and just kind of put this team on his back as well, Siakam. Living in the New York market, I can tell you the Halliburton name has been dragged through the mud consistently over the last two weeks of, you know, whether it was his outfits that he wore, games that he didn't show up for. It was like he was under the microscope so much, especially being compared to Jalen Brunson. And I feel like at the end of the day, Terry Halliburton, he's, he's, a, he's got the winning formula. I can't say he's a winner because he has won in the past, but you could see like when the Pacers added Halliburton, everything for this franchise changed. He gets his teammates involved. He hits big shots. This was that moment that you could look back and say, this is the biggest game of his career. What's he going to do? And he responded on the biggest stage under the brightest lights. And for that, I mean, th these type of players, they do not grow on trees. He is every bit of a max player. And landing Tyrese Halliburton was the turning point for this franchise moving forward. I, I feel that uh, what he's what he's brought to the table is just something that I just don't know where this franchise overall would be without him. But I'm so happy that he's our point guard who's young, under a max contract that's about to start. And we know that he's only getting better. This type of experience you cannot simulate. This is what players need to go from good to great. And this is the reason why he's on Team USA with the best in the world representing our country this summer. He's a great basketball player. And I think that we're starting to see who he can really be at after the hamstring injury has kind of gone away. I think his back looked a lot better over the time after he got hurt against the Bucks. So it's just one of those things where it's just taking time for him to get more comfortable in his, you know, I guess you could say new hamstring, whatever you want to call it, because it's just been one of those things where he never looked the same after he got hurt back in January against the Celtics. So I think it's kind of interesting, almost poetic, that he's getting a chance to return against Boston because Indiana went 2-3 and three against Boston this year. They had one terrible loss, like 155-104. to 104. It was one of our most watched videos on YouTube because Boston oh, fans Indian were just Indian. like, we felt bad for you guys. We just wanted to hear what you had to say. But I I'm just going to say it out there. Like, no. the in-season tournament game where they, where they knocked off the Celtics at Gambridge Fieldhouse were able to advance to Vegas. That was, in, that was one of the most fun games of the regular season, probably the most fun game of the regular season. And then you talk about the game where Matherin got fouled by Porzingis at the end of the game. Indiana wins that one, like 133 to 131. They were ahead in Boston, the game that Tyrese made his return from the hamstring injury after he had to miss more time and then came back in this one and was on a minutes restriction, so he couldn't play basically the second half. But Indiana was right there in that game, and Siakam was really good in that game. So – I'm not saying that Boston's, you know, not the better team or anything like that, but I just think that Halliburton has had success against this Boston team. And I know they've done a very good job of hunting him, and we'll talk more about that with Keith Smith tomorrow on our preview show. But Halliburton is just a young star in the making. And no matter how far this run goes, whether it stops at the Eastern Conference Finals, if they have a miraculous finals run or even win the NBA Finals, you know, who wants to set the ceiling on what this team can do this year? I just think it's going to make Tyrus Halliburton that more hungry to be great. And sometimes you have to learn by failing in this Pacers team. They've had their failures throughout the season. They've had their failures throughout these series a little bit, but they've been able to overcome the bad performances and write that ship a little bit and, and get this team on, on track for the right spot, you know, moving forward. So I just think that the way Halliburton has led has been with excellence and he is a talker. He is a chirper. And I can understand why if you are another team, you do not like this guy, but he's our point guard. He is our point God. He is a phenomenon in the league. He is a future 
star of this league. He is a star already, but he's a future superstar of this league, future face of this league. And he's putting his map, you know, putting himself on the map right now because of how excellent he is. And so I, I want to say thank you again to the Halliburton heckler, like I mentioned earlier, for getting him going. Very Reggie Miller-esque. You cannot very. deny that. It felt very Reggie Miller-esque in the garden. Wasn't Spike Lee, but anybody that wants to talk trash tires, Halliburton, he'll engage and it motivates. Hey, there was a time you wanted me to start heckling Halliburton. I told you. I'm, going in. I'm glad someone else was able to do it. So uh, my, my name's clear on that. But yeah, I mean, this is how you become great. I can't wait to see what he does next. But one pacer that we have not talked about yet that absolutely deserves it, Miles Turner. Yeah, Turner stuck with this Pacers team, you know, through thick and thin all these years. We had said before, hey, he hadn't really showed up in the playoffs before. You know, it's what could he do? He was just rock solid in this series against the Knicks. Averaged 16 points per game, six boards, but the impressive part, 54% shooting from the field, 48% from three, and he averaged 2.3 blocks per game. I felt like Turner was, you know, outside of pretty much, you know, one game or so, was very consistently good for this Pacers team and uh, that we, we knew that he had to show up. And I felt like the last two games, he really showed up in, in terms of, you know, outperforming Hardenstein, being able to keep him off the glass, things like that, like be able to be a big. And I feel like that the Pacers did a great job keeping the Knicks off the glass. One team thing that I want to talk about is we mentioned before, win the rebounding battle. That's going to be be the big thing the team that wins the rebounding battle will win the game that's how that's how the trend has been yeah 28 rebounds by the knicks alex a season low for new york in game seven when you needed to keep them off the glass how about that you know what keeps people off the glass fachi making your dang shots 67.1 percent ain't gonna give you many rebounds off fachi so (laughs) that plays a huge part in it but they did a good job collectively just not allowing the Knicks too many offensive rebounds. There was a couple possessions here and there where the Knicks were a little bit, you know, able to get in there and get their hands on a ball, things like that. But for the majority of the time, Indiana did a very good job boxing out and being physical really after game five. Game six, they were phenomenal at that. We talked about that at the end of game six. But talk about Miles Turner. I mean, he he literally told the Pacers social team that he had to fight back tears because he was so excited. And you know what I said, Miles, you know, let those tears fall, man, because like nine years, of not making it out of the first round of the playoffs or even making the playoffs or probably a majority of those years. And so now that you're getting a chance with this team, which he called a special group, he said that to the media, I think about the halfway point of the season, like this is probably one of the most special teams I've been on since the 17, 18 run. And they ran into LeBron James who made it to the NBA finals that year. And LeBron James almost, I think he had, that was his incredible game one against the Warriors where J.R. Smith had the meme moment. So, I mean, LeBron was probably at his peak at that point or right there about it. So that was a tough team to to beat, and you almost beat him in in seven games. I think Miles just understands how special this team is. He's in his prime, getting to play with a guy like Pascal at the four, Tyrese at the one, and then two dogs and Nimhart and Neesmith at the two and the three. Like, he knows how special this team is and and just what kind of guys they've got. He talked about it in the post-game press conference. Like, we have guys that have no egos. They've left their ego at the door. They're here to win basketball games. And it starts when you have leaders like him and Halliburton and Siakam that are able to put their ego aside for the betterment of the team. And one guy that echoes that and really represents that well and reflects that well is T.J. McConnell. T.J. McConnell did not have a great series against the Bucs. He had a good game against the Bucs. I believe it was in game six. But really, he was not playing well in those first five games. The entirety of the seven-game series, with the exception probably of game three, you saw T.J. McConnell play lights out for this Pacers team and provide a spark off the bench that was necessary for them to win. Tyrese Halliburton alluded to their bench as the best bench in the NBA. Once again, he's been saying it all year long, but their uh, their ability to just go out there and keep that pace going and even maybe play at a, pa- a faster pace when him and Obi enter the game, it just wore the Knicks down over a seven-game series. And TJ McConnell, once again, double digits tonight was phenomenal. I said it earlier, I'm going to say it again. McConnell was a killer in this series. He made plays that whether it was threes that just absolutely amped up the crowd, whether it was that steal that we talked about that led to a Neesmith and one, he made very big plays countless times. He was always able to get into the paint and be able to get what he wanted. And in the series, he averaged about 12 points per game on 51% shooting. 
Uh, that's above what he gave you in the regular season. TJ McConnell was better in this series in round two than he was in the regular season. I mean, how about that when plenty of people said, yeah, I just don't know how McConnell is going to be in the playoffs. Will he be part of that rotation? How many minutes will he play? Things like that. He played great against the Knicks. So that was awesome to see. And I felt like you could always just that spark that he's brought all season long. That spark was very evident. And the Knicks didn't have one of those guys. Alec Burks at times, I guess, was kind of like that. But when McConnell came in, that's when I was really like licking my chops to pick, okay, this is what we need. Well, let's, let's get it going right now. And I feel like he brought it. He became the first player in NBA playoff history off the bench. We've got so much history going on. I don't know how many of these stats I got left, but I got at least one more right here. <laughs> TJ McConnell had 40 or more assists and less than 10 turnovers in this series. That wow. has never been done for a player to come off the bench. How about that? How about that? I mean, TJ McConnell, for all the doubters, even we at times doubted TJ McConnell. I think he has had the best season of his career right now. No doubt. And I don't think there, and we're going to talk about offseason stuff, but I just don't think there's any way you can get rid of him at this point. I, I think that he means too much to this Real team. Yeah, yeah. Sorry to cut you off. One Nick fan goes, is he a free agent, by the way? I said, he's absolutely not. You can't have him. Hands off. All right. The team option. They're looking at him. They're like, I want that. That's what we need. Well, you can't have him. He's still a bars. Yeah, when the Knicks broadcast for ESPN, you know, J.J. Reddick has to put his headset off give him a hug, and then he kissed him on the cheek and said, love you, man. You know, you're getting all this love from J.J. Reddick. He said, your stars have to show up. Your Batman and your Robin have to show up. He talked about Halliburton and Siakam showing up. He said, but you also need your Alfred to show up. And he called Alfred T.J. McConnell, which he referenced in his podcast video that he did on YouTube, calling T.J. McConnell one of his Alfreds of the 2023-2024 season. So really full circle moment, but I just think it's poetic, Fachi, that Mike Breen, the voice of the New York Knicks on their regular broadcast, is a national broadcaster for ESPN, does a great job. Everybody loves Mike Breen. Um, I think Doris Burke is someone that people have a hard time listening to uh, for whatever reason. You know, I'm not going to get into the crushing Doris Burke too much or J.J. Redick, but I'll just say this. I thought it was hilarious that the four games that Mike Breen broadcasted in this series were all four pacer wins. So pretty poetic, pretty awesome for Indiana to be able to, you know, set Mike Breen up to be able to call his home team lose four games to Indiana. And uh, let's let's just talk about this for a second. Reggie Miller on his Instagram account, Fachi, shared the video. You got the Reggie jersey on. Shared the video from game two when he yeah. called the game. And Josh Hart came over and said, I think they're saying F you, Reggie, just to make sure he knew that. He said, that's when I knew the series was over. He shared that, plus all the different stories of everybody celebrating this victory and Tyrese wearing the sweatshirt with him choking at Spike Lee when the Knicks choked. And he said, I love this. So I just think it was great. No, Reggie wasn't on more than one call for this series, but Reggie Miller clapping back at the uh, at the New York Knicks and the New York Knicks fan base. I, I absolutely love it. I mean, look, hey, the, the last time the – you know, the Knicks got to play a game seven in the garden. Reggie was the one that put him out, you know, and sent him packing back home. So 95. So it was great that he was able to see his Pacers do it today. Um, I just feel oh, that. Let me just say this. Yeah. Reggie said in the comment section or on his, on his caption, God don't like ugly. <laughs> and then Rick Smith's oh my comments God. on the post and said, yes, sir. So <laughs> We've got the former Pacers from the 95 team that won the last game seven in Madison Square Garden chirping in and doubling down on these Knickerbockers. I love it. Sorry to interrupt you. Just just like old times. I mean, that that is great. But what, what I love is like they're coming into this year, we didn't really know who the Pacers rival even was or who's like on our level. I feel like through this year, now we've created a rivalry with the Bucks. We've definitely renewed that rivalry with the Knicks. It it's just great. And the one thing that I think could be a little bit different is. The media and all that. I don't know if they want Boston to win. Like, we might actually have more people rooting for the Pacers because there's people that Boston came to this season with the expectations championship or bust. I would like to think that maybe, maybe some people will root for the underdog in this series. But like I said before, like I tweeted it out, don't let anybody take it away from you guys of what we have earned because the highs and lows, we've stuck with this team. There's been lineups where we've, you know, rooted for them when we knew the outcome wasn't going to be pretty. A night like this is everything.
anything of what it's about to be a Pacers fan, I am not afraid to say I am head over heels in love with this team. Yeah, it's been a fun ride, Fachi. And I tweeted about a player that doesn't get a lot of shine, and it's Ben Shepard. Ben Shepard, and the role that he has played has been absolutely phenomenal in what he's done. We've, we've given him a little praise here and there. He's not the headliner for any of your talking points or anything like that. But when he's out there in the game, Fachi, you can feel his presence. It's, it's nice that the Pacers now have a third wing they can go to to make you know defensive matchups. You know, if Neesmith gets in foul trouble, here comes Ben Shepard, and you trust him. He's got incredible footwork. Seems to really know where to be at at the right time, at the right, you know, when the, when the play is going on. Knows when I saw the one play where he actually cut baseline as he was watching the Knicks had their back turned, and I think they got on the ball on the baseline. Now, I don't think he shot it, but it was just really cool to see him realize that opening there take advantage of it, get open. But he just had some really good basketball plays. His three-point shot's been much more lively and, and accurate and efficient in the playoffs. And not only that, uh, I want to give Isaiah Jackson some love tonight because he had nine points in this game, Fachi. He was the second and, leading scorer off the bench for the Pacers behind TJ McConnell. And what he did was so special to me in this series after not being a part of the rotation for the past couple of months to be able to stay ready and, and to come in here and really have an impact with that bench even had that nice little fake today where he got the and one too. So Isaiah Jackson, we're seeing a little bit of growth from him. And I think sometimes when your butt meets the bench, you realize what it takes to be special to go out there and earn those minutes. And and he did that didn't sulk, didn't pout. And he earned the minutes as a backup center. And we'll see if that continues against Boston. But uh, I was just really proud of him as well. Stayed ready and made the most of all of his minutes. Going back to Ben Shepard real quick, his 25 minutes were the most of any pacer off the bench, and it was just solid. Four points, five boards, three assists, two steals, a block, zero turnovers. He was plus 10. Those are just mm. good minutes right yep. there. And, you know, when Matherin went down, we looked at the bench and we went, ugh, I just don't know what they're going to do. Like, what's going to happen? And guys like Ben Shepard really just stepped up. Isaiah Jackson really just stepped up. I mean, you got, you know, Doug McDermott hasn't given the Pacers anything in the playoffs. They haven't given them any, you know, really any minutes. And, you know, it's just, it, it's been the next guy up. Like, who do you got to work with? Obi Top and McConnell, great. They brought it every night. Isaiah Jackson, when called upon, awesome. Ben Shepard, as, as consistent as can be. Ben Shepard honestly hasn't had a bad game, I feel no. like, in, in the playoffs, or at least this round. He's just been someone they can count on. And coming in this season, you looked at this group, the guys that we just talked about, think about that. McConnell, expect to be out of the, ro- out of the rotation. Isaiah Jackson, it was like, okay, yeah, they'll, they'll pick up his, his option, but I don't know if he's really going to, you know, contribute to this team. He's played great. You know, Ben Shepard, you didn't know what kind of role he was going to have. All those guys that had minimal expectations, even Obi Toppin was a, a toss-up at times, played great. Obi Toppin led all players off the bench in points in the playoffs. Mm. I mean, that is just crazy stuff. Number two is TJ McConnell. So the bench... It's been as advertised. Can't even imagine them with uh, Benedict Matherin right now, but it's just been great stuff. I feel like this is what you see of the depth, and usually in the playoffs is where depth doesn't come in. They shorten the rotations. Indiana has enough players to have a a larger rotation than than many uh, would anticipate, and I feel like tonight just everybody brought it when they needed it most. It was a great game, Fachi. It was a great game plan, and I think the Pacers executed it. I think it started off by taking advantage of OG and Anobi's inability to really run up and down the court, keeping, you know, putting OG in the, in the start of the game, I think for New York was a mistake by, by Tom Thibodeau. I understand that he was, you know, healthy enough to maybe play and try it out. But what we had saw from Deuce McBride in games five and game six, he was really good in those two games, especially with the starting five. And I think pulling him out really did impact what New York had flow wise and, and got Indiana into a rhythm with OG not being able to keep up and run up and down the court with Pascal. Like there was even that one time when the Knicks made a basket and Pascal just leaked out because OG couldn't stay with him. And he got a wide open fast break. I think Ben Shepard ended up making the layup, something like that. So it's just little moments like that where you realize the Pacers being in such great shape, them pressing for 94 feet the entirety of the series and really putting pressure on New York, able to stay out of foul trouble. They really just brought the energy and the effort for the entirety of a seven game series. And eventually it wore the Knicks down. You had OG who really couldn't return from the, from the uh, hamstring. Jalen Brunson fractures his hand in game uh, seven. Josh Hart hurts himself in game six with an ab strain and they don't have any depth. 
you know, Julius Randle, Bojan Bogdanovic, those guys were already out. And Mitchell Robinson went down after game one. So it was just one of those things where the best ability is availability. And the Pacers have themselves conditioned to play this style of basketball for the long haul. And they've got a lot of guys that really aren't injury prone on this team. I know Halliburton's dealt with injuries in his career and so has Miles Turner, but really for the most part, they've been able to stay healthy outside of the Matherin shoulder injury. But he's a top five, top six player on this team too. So they're not even at full strength yet. And that's what makes it even more exciting because the best thing this team is getting right now is experience. Nobody expected them to be here at this point, but being in a game seven in the garden is the greatest experience and the teaching tool you can ever get in playoff basketball. And this team dominated New York on the road. So yes, Indiana, this is a special moment. Pacer fans love it, live it, and don't let it go because moments like these don't come around all the time. But when they do, they're special and soak it all in like a sponge because this is a great time to be a Pacer fan. I felt like today we all earned our stripes. Like These players earned the stripes. They can now say we're battle-tested. That's something they couldn't say. That first round against Milwaukee was not a battle. That was the Pacers, you know, winning the series. You know, they didn't really face much adversity other than being down, you know, 0-1. Um, so I felt like this was the true battle. They responded. They were down two games, nothing. Okay, what are you going to do? you got to win four of the next five. Now, they did it. They mm. won game seven on the road. That is something that every player now can go on and be better because they went through this type of experience. I'm going to be honest. I told Alex, you know, uh, you know, offline before, before we went on this, I kind of had like a little speech made up in my mind that I was going to thank everybody. Hey, appreciate everybody that tuned in. We had a great run. This is the most fun season that we've had. Like, you know, I know that now the season ends, you know, some of you guys might hop off like, Oh man, the ride continues. And I want to thank everybody that's been a part of this because we ain't done yet. We're going to keep bringing you the best content that we could possibly bring you night in, night out as we take on those Celtics. You, some could say David versus Goliath. You got the team that's been to so many conference finals, expected to win it all. You got the team that no one expected to be there, but you can't, you can't measure hurt. And they said our style of play was not sustainable in the playoffs. Draymond said it. Many people said it. Look what the Pacers did today. They set records on offense today. And what we have right now, you simply cannot simulate if you're Boston. No asterisks for this Pacers team, this Pacers run. It is what it is. They play who's in front of them. And we're not going to discredit Indiana for getting to this point because they've earned it. And that's the bottom line. But Fachi, I will say this. Game three, Saturday night, Memorial Day weekend. On, a, on Saturday, Sunday, Indy 500. On Monday, Game 4. What a special weekend in Indianapolis to have racers and pacers. I'm not the biggest Indy 500 fan. I've never been. I know there's a lot of people that love it, right? Indianapolis Motor Speedway, everybody loves it. I've been around the track. I've never actually been to the track. I, I guess you can't really say I'm a true Indiana native if I'm not a fan of racing, but I guess that's just how I've always been brought up. I just never got into it. But Maybe one day I'll make it out of the racetrack at some point, experience an Indy 500. But I know what it means to a lot of Pacer fans here that are in, in love with racing. So what an incredible weekend for them to be able to experience that. But get out, get your tickets, make sure it's loud in Gamebridge Field. Now, Spachi, I'm just saying gut feeling right now. Going into this Boston series, what is your prediction? Look, I hate to be the guy that's like, oh, man, well, Boston takes it. I mean, look, if, if Boston should take this, I, I would love I would love to at least say that this is going six. I think Celtics and have, seven is what I'm picking. Okay, all right. I, I would. I guess I'm going to say Celtics and six. I feel dirty even saying it. But I felt like at some point, you know, this is a Boston team that, that should have already won a ring by now. The Pacers have been great at, at home. Uh, there's no Porzingis for at least games one and two as of right now. Who knows? That is definitely worth something. So for right now, I'll say Celtics and six, but I'd give just about anything to be wrong. Same here, but I'm just saying Pacers are six and zero at home in their in their in their playoff run here, Fachi. So game three, game four, boom, two wins. You know, right in the you know Indy 500, right in the middle of two Pacers gold out wins, and then come back, force a game seven. I, I mean, hey, why not? Right, do it again. Why not? Let's put some pressure on those Boston Celtics. We've 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 played them decent throughout the regular season. It's a totally different environment now with uh, the playoffs and and who they have and and how good they've been. But you know what? 
let's just hope the Celtics don't overlook Indiana because I think if they do, Indiana could steal a game on the road too. It, it, it very well could. You you touched on it when we talked about the, the season series and the regular season against Boston. Tyrese wasn't on a minute restriction. There's a very good chance that Indiana may have won that season series three to two instead yeah. of you know losing it two to three. So I don't think that uh, Boston should be overlooking the Pacers because they're not the same team that that Boston beat by almost 50 early in the season. Indiana has changed drastically, and I think the Celtics are going to remember that in-season tournament loss in, in one of these type of playoff atmospheres. But yeah, this is an Indiana team that kind of in the earlier season, I don't want to call them boys, but they are absolutely men right now after what they have gone through in the first two rounds. And Boston really hasn't been challenged. They just overcame uh, a, a Cavs team that towards the end, I don't want to say threw in the towel, but you know that closeout game, no Donovan Mitchell, no Karis LeVert, no Jared Allen. There, there was a lot of guys that were out. Uh, so I don't think that was the best series win for Boston I think that they're going to have their hands full the most through two rounds at least going into you know the Eastern Conference Finals as they have in this playoffs overall run the wheels off of Boston that's all I'm going to say run them to death like I did the Knicks and you just never know what could happen but Bocci with that being said it's been a lot of fun talking about this game seven victory in the garden the mecca of basketball the Pacers take down the Knicks left the Knicks crowd quiet Far too often in game seven, it was crickets in there. The ghost of Fachi was lingering in there, just reminding everybody, hey, Pacer fans, I might not be here pre- in the present, but my, my spirit still lives on and the Sirs are going to win this game. So with that being said, my man, thank you for staying home. I appreciate it. You are a, a hey, true me. fan here. Nah, I mean, true fan. I had I had Knicks fans saying, you're not a true fan. How could you pass up game seven? This might never happen again. And I was like, I know, but trust me, I'll never live it down. If I go, we lose. And then I spend what is like the most expensive ticket out there. Like game seven tickets were disgustingly expensive. Uh, I had one of my friends that asked me five different times to go, ended up finding someone else. He went. I think he had the worst time he's probably ever had. Um, Good. so, you know, I think I would have been screw the only your friends. One what was that? I said, screw your friends. Yeah, hey, you know what? But I'm telling you right <laughs> now, I'm looking at that schedule right now and I'm just trying to plot my way to Indy for a, a game against the Celtics. I don't know how much longer I could stay back and stay on the couch. I'm itching for some Pacer basketball right now. And I hope everybody else is too. Memorial day weekend, baby. You got a perfect opportunity with that extra day of vacation. So. You know, just let me know. But with that being said, tell everybody where they can find us at as we continue our Pacers playoff coverage for the next round, Fudge. You can find us on Twitter at PacersPodSTP. You can find Alex on Twitter at AlexGoldenNBA. I can be found on Twitter at underscore F-A-C-C-I. You can find us on Instagram at PacersPodSTP. You can find us on Facebook, Setting the Pace. You can find us on TikTok, Setting the Pace. And Alex, tell them where they can check us out on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, go to youtube.com slash setting the pace, a Pacers podcast where you can see all of our video content. And hey, you might even see Kristen Airy make or miss a few three point attempts on an eight and a half foot rim. But uh, if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe to the channel and make sure you're following us on all audio platforms. If you're not listening to us on YouTube, because we would really appreciate that as well. Spotify, Apple, you know, just make sure you're following, leave us a five star rating interview. It really helps the show out. But with that being said, Fachi, if you're excited, that the blue and gold are back in the Eastern Conference Finals once again, then hit me with those three words. Let's go Pacers!